The fee is interesting because fee is universal. Like no matter how the way that people's relations with this asset class changes, fee is always going to be something that people have to pay. Everyone, regardless of how complex your transactions are, it doesn't matter if it's a wallet, simple wallet transfer, or you're doing NFT mint, or you're doing like multi-block MEV, you're trying to capture. It doesn't matter the complexity, you're all competing for the same resource. And these resources are quite limited. They can't scale based on demand just because demand suddenly scaled. Demand is quite ephemeral comparing to uh, how inelastic supply is. So pricing the access to these resources will always be a market-oriented problem. Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Ryan Crane, and today I'm speaking with Leo Chan, who is the founder and CEO of Alchemia. Alchemia which is a project that's creating a market for block space. So before we're going to talk with Leo, it's just a few words from our sponsors this week. This episode is proudly brought to you by Gnosis, a visionary collective committed to fostering and expanding applications for a decentralized future. Gnosis is at the forefront of innovation with Gnosis Pay, Circles, and Metri, revolutionizing open banking and creating a superior form of money. With Hashi and Gnosis VPN, they are building a more resilient and privacy-focused open internet. Are you seeking a robust L1 to launch your project? Well, look no further than Gnosis Chain. Enjoy the same development environment as Ethereum, but with significantly lower transaction fees. And with a robust network of over 200,000 validators, Gnosis Chain stands as a credibly neutral and resilient foundation for your application. Governance at Gnosis is driven by Gnosis DAO, where everyone has a voice in shaping the project's future. Join the Gnosis community today by participating in the Gnosis DAO governance forum. You can deploy your project on the EVM compatible and highly decentralized Gnosis chain, or help secure the network by running a validator with just a single GNO and low cost hardware. Embark on your journey towards decentralization today at Gnosis.io. Cars 1 is one of the biggest node operators globally and help you stake your tokens on 45 plus networks like Ethereum, Cosmos, Celestia and DYDX. More than 100,000 delegators stake with Chorus One, including institutions like BitGo and Ledger. Staking with Chorus One not only gets you the highest yields, but also the most robust security practices and infrastructure that are usually exclusive for institutions. You can stake directly to Chorus One's public node from your wallet, set up a white label node, or use the recently launched product, Opus, to stake up to 8,000 ETH in a single transaction. You can even offer high yield staking to your own customers using their API. Your assets always remain in your custody, so you can have complete peace of mind. Start staking today at Chorus.one. Thanks so much for coming on, Leo. It's really great to have you on the podcast. Thanks for having me, Brian. Should also mention here, brief disclaimer, that with course one, we actually did invest in Alchemia. Tell us a little bit about, like, how did you get into crypto? Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I started my career right after graduating. I, uh, my first job was in traditional finance. I was doing uh, equity derivative, uh, some pricing, some modeling. Uh, it was not the most uh, riveting job i had to say um but i i follow um a you know a, a relatively um you know stereotypical traditional finance path for about you know two three years um and in 2016 i became obsessed with bitcoin and a uh, lot and and i started going to um uh, some of the meetups in new york it was still very very small at the time there are not that many people talking about it there are not many firms doing it full time um, but in 2016, I was pretty certain that I wanted to, uh, I wanted to see this become a real thing full time. Uh, it, it was a lot more exciting back then, <laughs> to be honest. I think the possibility of this growing into a, a real thing. Uh, it is a slight digression, but I was just, you know, looking at, um, you know, people cheer, like celebrating uh, Trump speaking at Nashville, uh, politicians endorsing it. Like you know, like 2016, people would be will be mind blown by you know <laughs> by this but and and i know you know this is something that people wanted for a very long time right this becoming mainstream and now that black rocks picking up some countries talking about making this uh, asset a national reserve and it's very clear now this is mainstream asset but i kind of missed the the sentiment back then when 
uh, we're still just trying to figure out like, you know, what to do after the Ethereum DAO hack. Um, and, but anyways, um, I, uh, yes. So I joined a small a crypto fund in New York, uh, around 2017. Um, I was a researcher there, uh, after ICO in 2017, there were really not that many, you know, interesting thing to look at. <laughs> So I end up spending a lot of time doing uh, mining, uh, spinning up mining operations, sourcing machines from China, setting up uh, data centers. So that that was my, um, I guess, journey into block space. I guess, um, and, and it, around around 20, um, 2020, I had uh, uh, sort of the vague framework. So that was for for Bitcoin or for like other other cryptos. Oh, there were a lot of things. Uh, GPU, I uh, was mining a lot of like smaller coins as well. Uh, that, that was the game to play at the time. You know, it, it was um, some of these smaller, smaller projects and you use GPU to mine it for a while and it pumps and, and you know, it, it, I mean, it's, it's, it, it's not that different from um, the ICO game, to, to, but, but the distribution was uh, required a bit of work, I, I think. Yeah, so, so in 2020, I had the vague framework for what later became Alchemia at, at the time. So... Uh, I left that job to to sort of uh, try to craft this idea. Um, I started writing about um, some of, I guess, observations and reflections of the mining industry. Um, and uh, uh, in 2021, put together a small team, and um, that was the birth of Alchemia. And then what was, when you started working on it, what was the vision that you saw for Alchemia? It was definitely very different from the project, from the version that we have live now. That was the, uh, I guess, the prototype. The prototype at the time was very much um, catered towards uh, miners. Well, at the time, you know, uh, both Bitcoin miners as well as ETH uh, preferred miners. And the although the discourse at the time was much, much, much more interesting because um, that was just the beginning of, I guess, people taking uh, MEB more seriously and just trying to understand like how. Uh, what kind of roles that MEV is going to play in uh, for ETH miners, my, my mining pools, um, and and just very very early stage conversations. Uh, but anyways, so I uh, at the time the focus was more for uh, for miners to hedge against their cost. Uh, so the instrument that they will be creating will be a like synthetic representation of um, the revenue produced by their hash power. Uh, and later the so that that version we launched um, in early 2022, and that version ran about uh, 35-ish million in transaction volume. But towards the end of 2022, we saw very clearly the growth uh, slow down. And at the time, we we're not sure if it's you know mining industry was changing or just this is the fundamental uh, bottleneck of the of the of the sector. Uh, but the conclusion we had was that like our protocol was not good enough. So how we start working on a second iteration. I mean, I can see as a miner, right? I'm basically spending all of this money on building mining farms. And then, uh, of course, I don't know exactly what the revenues are going to be. So if I can kind of hedge some of the, my future revenues, then that can decrease my risk. So that was kind of the, the target. And, and I'm curious on the other side, like who would take the other side of that trade? Yeah, that was exactly the problem. So we we're hoping that we can create something that can capture the cash flow of mining revenue uh, and present it as sort of as something that's um, uh, a new, I guess, atomic toy for, for the rest of the DeFi universe. The challenge we faced at the time was that, and, and also the context at, at in, in 2020, that was just around DeFi summer, right? like midway into it. And, and we're just looking at the source of the yield, right? It is uh, all, all these all these fruits, uh, fruits themed uh, yield source is either inflation or just solid volatility. And uh, at the time, we thought, okay, you know, this is something. This is revenue generated from from uh, producing blocks. This is you know, this is block subsidy. This is the actual transaction fee people pay to process their transactions. And there are a lot of like interesting dynamics there. Um, as is a much more, I guess, organic cash flow. <laughs> Uh, comparing to just pure token inflation, um, so the conceptually we thought it was it was it was sound and and um, to as a building block. However, I think we we underestimated the complexity of just how much jargon there is in a in a mining sector and how small it has gradually become over the years. Um, especially after China banned the mining industry and a lot of them moved to North America, 
the type of players in North America are much more traditional, I should say. They are more from you know energy, oil, and gas industries. They are much more interested in playing the traditional capital markets game, equity, debts, SPAC, uh, rather than something that's crypto native. So that severely restricted the size of the playable, uh, addressable market, I guess. Um, so anyways, but during this journey, we realized that, hey, people are much more interested in just the fee component. Peter Hash, all like Peter Hash, all these things are, are pretty difficult to talk about outside of Beyond the Miners. Um, but just the fee, the fee is interesting because fee is universal. Like no matter how, uh, how, how much like the way that people's relations with this asset class changes, fee is always going to be something that people have to pay. And and at the time, okay, rollups are starting to post like millions of dollars uh, with call data to pay for call data on L1. Um, there are like serious commercial activities taking place on chain that are starting to look more and more like. Um, energy energy industries where people have to hedge against the fluctuation of electricity price. Um, large utility companies were hedging against um, yeah the primary resources they were using. So it became very obvious to us that hey, this is um, this one slice of the uh, of the of the block like revenue being produced by the block space produce the block producers is much more interesting uh, for for infrastructures that building on chain, uh, frequent settlers, right? Uh, uh, service providers who need to settle on chain regardless of the fee environment. Um, so this essentially became our primary focus for the version that we uh, just launched. Okay. So now the focus is on fees. So basically that people can uh, trade the future of transaction fees. Yes. I mean, so I think right now it's just like for Bitcoin, but then you want to do it for Ethereum or like for 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 all the major networks. Yeah. So the architecture is synthetic. So in theory, we can support anything that has high volatility and people want to hedge. Uh, I mean, there's several factors of uh, considerations to take to 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 address. One, this is still a marketplace, so we need we need buyers and sellers to be balance for mining it's it's easier because without a uh, frick it's actually not has nothing to do with proof of work versus proof of stake it's really uh yeah if you want five five nine um without one five five nine you know uh bitcoin is just first price auction it's it's very straightforward the transaction fee they go to mine pool it distributed to the miners um so anything that people pay we can find strong correlations to what the mining uh the, the sorry the the mining post they ultimately collect Whereas for EIP one five nine, this is very different, right? So validators don't actually collect the base fee, um, and um, most of your income is from is is from block rewards uh, these days. Right? <laughs> uh, and and given the I guess much more reduced on chain activities, um, four 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 is definitely changing things uh, for for validators on L one. And there's just a lot of I guess moving pieces uh, of how people, where people want to take Ethereum, right? In, in terms of how the, the relations of, of builders and proposers and, and users. Um, I think there's a lot, a lot of changes that's being proposed right now. And there, and, and I, I almost lost track of like the, the, the latest discourse, but um, yeah, it went from Pepsi to, to Braid. Um, I think there's just a lot of direction that people are pulling uh, ETH towards. Um, and none of them really consider the the feelings of end users. <laughs> yeah, that, no, that's definitely true. So, can you tell, like, like when you have now this market for uh, transaction fees? I mean, who who do you see as the main parties that want to trade in this market? Yeah. So the kind of the most natural user, the most organic type of users who who are interested in these are service providers who have to settle on chain regardless of the fee environment. Right, so on ETH, this will be the sequencers. Uh, well, before four eight four four, they would have to pay call data, and now they pay call data and uh, or uh, and or blobs block fee. Um, and uh, applications who are uh, launching on uh, sorry, users of applications who are on L one, and like and these days, uh, they are starting to have a few meme coins popping up on ETH L one. Take advantage of the low fee. Uh, I, I guess ultrasound money meme is is not dead. But uh, the, the, these activities, they, they do uh, they do have pretty strong impact on the volatility of the base of the of the uh, of the I guess you know settlement cost 
for for regardless of the chain they're on, right? Uh, and for Bitcoin, this used to be you know Ordinals runes that had a pretty drastic impact on how full the the blocks were, um, and this has a pretty severe impact for you know service providers who just have to settle on chain regardless of the fee, how high the fee is. Um, one example that we saw uh, several weeks ago was um, so OKX they did um, UTXO consolidation, which is a very you know common. Uh, exchange housekeeping thing where they just combine a lot of like dust ETX. So exchanges do this, uh, centralized exchanges do this all the time. Uh, and they had a bug in their script where uh, their bots start bidding against each other and resulting fee to escalate during those uh, one, two, three days ish around that period. And OKX paid about 18 million in transaction fee. And so these kind of things that happen on chain all the time, right? All the time. Uh, in 2022 summer, um, other D had this crazy popular mint and, and users, I, I think it was something crazy, 150 million in gas costs incurred, right? That was the NFT crate, the, the, the peak of NFT summer. So it, it's, it, I mean, at, at the end of the day, this is, this is, um, everyone, regardless of how complex your transactions are, it doesn't matter if it's a wallet, simple wallet transfer. Or you're doing NFT mint, or you're doing like multi-block MEV. You're trying to capture. It doesn't matter the complexity. You're all competing for the same resource, and these resources are quite limited. They can't scale based on demand, just because demand suddenly scaled. Uh, I mean, uh, Parachain has some interesting ideas, but unfortunately, nobody's really using them. But uh, but but for most of the popular uh, popular public blockchains, this is the case. Right? Demand is quite ephemeral comparing to uh, how inelastic supply is. So pricing the access to these resources will always be a market-oriented problem. But so if you now, I don't know, you take some L2 or you take some other kind of application that needs L1, is the idea then that, I don't know, let's say at a time when maybe there's not so much demand, they kind of pre-purchase, right? Or, or they basically you know, take out some some asset that reflects how much they expect to spend in transaction fees over the next year for like, you know, all the different maturities or something. And then, uh, and then it will sort of be the inverse correlation with what they actually spend on chain when that time happens. And so then they can kind of have like, you know, a predictable cost for the next year or so. Is is that the kind of like trade that you expect people to make there? That's the that's the hope and dream. Yeah, um, I I think for service providers, although one year is is we have to grow there. Right now, the tenor is about two weeks. <laughs> if it's just two weeks, do you think it actually makes sense for some L two to like do this kind of thing? So L two, some of the L two is actually one shorter time. But it, it's it's very very uh, interesting. So. I had a conversation where one of the largest uh, sequencers they want like ten minutes. They want to trade every ten minutes because they want to. They want to have some more visible. These guys are pretty sophisticated. They have. They want more visibility on how they control the pricing. Um, but you know, it's impossible to find like sellers who are willing to sell on ten minute like basis un unless um, uh, unless sellers are you know uh, seriously taken advantage of. <laughs> but. Uh, there are also sequences who want to just like lock in, uh, you know, several months, a quarter, half a year, uh, which is also very hard to find uh, sellers who are that kind of like that bearish on on um, on the outcome of the uh, other activities on on that chain. So we're starting with you know some tenor in the middle and try to nurture this market and see which direction is more popular. Um, so with traditional uh, energy market, right, for oil, for instance. The oil companies, they would hedge very long term. They would buy futures that are, you know, quarter long or at least month long. Uh, but the speculators who are looking at, let's say, uh, the progress of, you know, uh, Ukraine-Russia war, and they're trying to think like some events, how they impact the oil price intraday, they would trade like intraday contract. Okay. 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 And then you've like on the i mean i can see that there's like some demand here or there could be some demand from the people who want to hedge who who do you think would be the other side is that just some kind of market maker hedge fund types or like who would want to trade this yeah yeah so for bitcoin it's easy for bitcoin it's the miners 
um, from and this is this is the reason we're starting with with Bitcoin first. It, it's pretty difficult to construct a market like this, which doesn't quite exist in the uh, doesn't exist in crypto at very least. Um, so we need to limit the number of variables that we're exposed to and just try to structure something simple and just try to establish a foothold uh, and, and grow and touch something that's more complex like uh, ETH, which has one five five nine, a lot of other moving pieces and and potential directions that people are taking uh, the, the I guess, block supply chain uh, uh, to. <laughs> uh, but with, 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 with Bitcoin miners, this problem is pretty pretty easy to illustrate to see right with more havings now we have so many havings at this point uh block subsidy is just in decreases very quickly and the industry is becoming more and more competitive highly industrialized highly competitive it's impossible for anyone with i don't know less than 10 million to spin up a real like mining operation anymore and the amount of like optimization you can get from data centers is de minimis at this point um so more and more of these uh, Bitcoin mining pl like, mm, players in Bitcoin mining field, they're starting to tr figure out, okay, how exactly do we capture more transaction fees? Uh, now that there are these meta protocols like Ordinals and Runes and some of their you know extensions, Bitcoin MEV is a thing now. It, it, there's a lot more sniping activity. And with 10 minute block time, uh, some weird behaviors we've never seen before on ETH are starting to emerge on Bitcoin. Uh, and there are like, serious uh, investments into MEV sniping toolings, anti-MEV sniping toolings in uh, Bitcoin. So you mean the miners would want to basically say, hey, I'm, I'm going to trade in this market because that way I can sort of, you know, guarantee some income stream. And then on the other side, it would be like wallets or exchanges that pay for user transactions. Yeah. Um, the on Bitcoin side, this is more, I guess, more custodian uh, type of user service providers compared to uh, because there's just much less on chain activities. With a different chain that has much more like on chain activities, this could be like anyone who's doing a large amount of like on chain transactions. This could be a project that's doing, you know, preparing for an NFT mint. And this is, uh, this is this is um, people who are expecting like a cascading liquidations because uh, like, several days ago, not sorry, I lost track of time or a week or two weeks ago or maybe two years ago, there was uh, ETH just dropped uh, like uh, pretty significantly, um, and there was a lot of like on chain liquidations that cascading fat and and uh, gas price went from five goy to uh, two hundred something. Uh, in a short period of time and uh, we came back down. Okay, okay. And then what? how do you imagine this product would look like on the Ethereum side? Yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, I think I think for the uh, the use case, like why people would use it, uh, why some service providers want to use it is very clear, especially with Paymasters. And this is, this is, Personally, I think it is a very good direction for end user UX, really, and and especially if can if, you explain maybe for what Paymaster? Oh yeah, so is. Uh, yeah, so uh, there are these services that um, so for example, a smart wallet that Coinbase just rolled out. Uh, so they will sponsor uh, transact. So they will allow users to pay gas in a token that's not ETH. Um, let's say, for example, uh, like Circle, for example, is pushing for a USDC-based um, paymasters for uh, obvious reasons. And so if user's wallet doesn't have ETH and they have uh, it's like app native token, and of course, paymaster alone wouldn't be able to uh, achieve that. But 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 just general account abstraction uh, bundle, hey. I guess, stack, I guess. Um, and, and with paymasters, they sort of effectively just concentrate end users responsibility of paying gas to a single entity so during that time they charge a fixed cost or even subsidy right free uh let's say one cent for for every uh wallet transfer um denominated in usdc for end users uh, and during this time the paymaster actually pays for the uh the the gas to to complete the transaction on chain um so during this time, the paymaster itself and whoever runs the paymaster who is paying for sponsoring the paymaster will have to take on the gas uh, volatility as well as the forex risk. So these these entities they are um, the primary type of user who really really would want to benefit from hedging. 
Um, otherwise, it's just be like marketing budget that keeps eating into their uh, revenue. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then what's the what's the state with the Ethereum product? Like, when are you planning to launch that? Uh, I don't want to share too much. Uh, I'm actually talking to Michael on your team about this. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, soonish. <laughs> Do you feel like in the longer run, these kind of instruments will end up becoming interested also for like more to tradfi to trade? Yeah, actually, the the funny thing is with tradfi people or 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 crypto traders who came from tradfi or quants mostly, they understand this right away. It's very intuitive that they've seen this like a million times in in, in like I guess real life, because <laughs> uh, because. It, it, the parallel with like commodity futures, energy futures, and just how like you know Starbucks hedges coffee being so that latte has a fixed cost um, and not fluctuating because all of like a forest burned down somewhere real time and all of a sudden a cup of coffee in New York like doubles price. Like it, it, it and and it, and you know uh, airlines hedges again like jet fuel price. These are you know establishments that has been being around for hundreds of years. Um, the in the past this wasn't really a problem for crypto because they were still not really that serious of use cases until more recently in more recent years um now with you know centralized exchanges uh traders who like have a lot of on-chain footprints uh yeah paymasters bridges and roll-ups um now that okay this consistency lead to uh the importance of having this type of instrument Right now, this the Alchemia product. It's on. It's built on base. Is that right? Or it's on L one. It's it's on each L one. Okay, okay. And I'm curious, for example, for the Bitcoin uh, transaction fee thing, do you need some kind of Oracle or like how do you get this data onto uh, L one? Yeah. So uh, yeah, we run our full nodes, and um, yeah, we and we use Oracle. We have we built our own Oracle essentially. It's it's an inevitable part, um, but we feel okay because it's pretty easy to verify this data. Like anyone who's running phone, or actually anyone who's who 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 access QuickNote or is able to verify this data. So it's not like some kind of like price oracle where you have to uh, pull you know some price information of a specific coin from uh, like multiple exchanges and compare it to millisecond ticks. This is uh, something that's very easy to verify for uh, anyone who uh, has basic understanding of how Bitcoin works. Okay, okay, okay. What What do you feel like we should talk about? I'm I'm actually interested in um, your view on you know because there's a lot of things that's going on with um, with the how people are thinking of like how the proposers role in 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 the ecosystem right and and i feel like proposers are one of the groups that get marginalized the most <laughs> while users and proposers like the 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 e3 researchers they they they, they think about users less and then uh, uh validators <laughs> and 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 uh and the rest of the stack um there, there are a lot of you know interesting directions and and a lot of them are are uh, have very clear trade-offs they all of them are pretty pretty complex, right? Going from uh, the old Pepsi fossil inclusion list uh, now to multi concurrent proposers with very clear trade off of sacrificing, you know, users uh, UX. Um, but I feel like all of them they they've almost never had you know conversation with validators or asked like how validators feel about the <laughs> the the, the uh, directions that that they're changing. Yeah, I, I I just wonder like how how what's your because you're you know on the front line of this. Um, I was just curious how you feel about all these directions that ETH is going. Yeah, I mean it's a good question. I mean actually we did uh, we did a podcast with Vitalik at EFCC and we asked him like, hey, do you, or I asked him, how do you feel about proposed builder separation today? You know, do you feel like this was a mistake or was it like the right thing? And he was kind of like, eh. <laughs> not really sure if I would do it again. Uh, so I feel a lot of it 
you know, it's kind of downstream from, you know, a proposal builder separation and then propo pursuing that path. And, and now, of course, you know, one of the situations which not sure, I, I don't think people are like particularly aware of it, right? But is that on the builder side, you know, it's really very concentrated, right? I think you have today like two builders that make up something like 90% of the blocks. And then, and then I, so I feel like a lot, uh, so, you know, there was maybe some idea, right? I think proposal builder separation to some extent where you basically say, okay, the validator doesn't build the block anymore, doesn't like arrange all the transaction, decide what goes into it. You know, of course, Flashbots was kind of the company that said, okay, let's try to split this up and have this separate system that uh, arranges the block and then the validator just gets the block. And then I, I think to some extent, you know, they they sort of said, oh, this is because we want to, it will help keep it more decentralized, make this open market so anyone can compete in. And I think that was one of the reasons why, you know, the Ethereum Foundation and researchers also kind of pushed this and then helped to make this part of the core Ethereum protocol. But I think the sort of unintended consequence was that actually in some ways it became much more concentrated because now, you know, if you look at the, the staking side, you know, the largest validators, you know, which I guess like Coinbase and Kraken or something like that, you know, they're like 30%. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're like 10, 15% or something like that. Now, when you look at the, uh, the block builders, right there, the largest block builders are more like 40%, right? So like the two largest, I think are together, like close 90 although, you know, it changes. So you have this big concentration there. And I think one of the, one of the things that, uh, that's driving, I think the Ethereum researchers is like, oh, how do we make this more decentralized? I mean, there's different concerns, but at least I think that's like one of them. And then, you know, they come up with some new thing and, uh, and you know, who knows what, uh, what the implications are of that. I mean, we are pretty in at the course one side we are, we are actually pretty you know we try to be pretty at the cutting edge of that so at the moment one of the areas that where there's the most interesting activities around this idea of pre-confirmations where it's basically something like you know you can get a promise or some kind of guarantee that a, a transaction will be included in a block further down the line and then I think there's also two different uh, philosophies that are two different approaches. One is the idea that the proposer, the validator would give this pre-confirmation. And then there's another approach where the builder could give this pre-confirmation. So I think that there's like different companies pursuing uh, those different paths. And, you know, we're kind of interested in it and we, you know, we run some of these things on test nets. But we're not sure we are like super opinionated there at the moment. Yeah, I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on pre-confirmations or like this, or like how that also intersects with uh, some kind of market for block space? Yeah, I I think um, pre the the one thing I I've I haven't really uh, and I, I think this is probably something that we just have to see how it unfolds in real life uh, is how to price these things, right? How to how to price how to price this future slot that you're going to sell. Um, and, and, and it's the same problem if you're like starting from the builder side or starting from the proposer side. Like for actually from from proposer side, uh, it's probably harder uh, because oh, okay, there needs to be enough like volatility. Okay, can you cancel? Can builders actually cancel it? Uh, I, as far as I know, there's no such option, right? Like they they buy, they have to they have to use it. Um, so I I think I think the the nature of this kind of commitment to uh, to buying, okay, uh, specific uh, like block in the future, without knowing, okay, what kind of content I'm about to produce, uh, about to include my block, it makes it very difficult to know like what kind of premium I'm going to pay for to 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 option for that, unless I have like a lot of like information about what I'm going to get. But I guess in the current landscape of the builders, where two players are highly highly have a lot more information than the rest, uh, this is potentially less of a problem. Um, but I, yeah, I'm really curious, like how builders actually, you know, react to this 
if there's interest, yeah, from them. Right. So yeah, I guess this gets kind of quite in the weeds. Uh, I mean, if you have, I think if you have, you know, in the end, right, the builder produces some block at this particular height and is like, hey, this is this is the block. It includes all these transactions and here's how much I'm willing to pay for it. And then the validator will basically compare the different blocks for the different builders and choose the one that kind of pays the most. Now, of course, if the if the validator or the proposal kind of goes to the to the builder and says, "Hey, you have to include this transaction," then it's like a constraint for the builder, and uh, and then it may lower uh, the value of that block. I mean, it depends also what what does it mean, right? Because is it? I think from my conversations here, it seems like something like an arbitrage transaction probably wouldn't be suitable for a, a proposal pre-confirmation, right? Because, because like in an arbitrage transaction, you say like, okay, you know, there's like some DEX state or some uh, Uniswap pool, for example, and you can make an arbitrage of some other thing and you get that transaction in and then someone is willing to pay a lot for that because they can make a lot from that. But I think the the, like... For the proposer to basically uh, promise to include a, such a transaction, I think it doesn't really work very well because one is that the proposer is too slow because like the proposer has to communicate back and forth to the builder and then uh, so they, they're at sort of disadvantage there. And then I guess the other thing is that you know, let's say now the proposer makes a bunch of money because they're getting paid to include some transaction. That is basically money that the builder is not making, you know. So it's not really like a net gain. Uh, and, uh, and and if you, of course, the other thing is the order of the transactions in the block, right? For For that transaction to be effective, right, it would have to come first in the block. But then that's the most valuable block space, right? The, I guess the first part and the last part. So yeah, I don't know. Uh, it's it's all very complicated. And, and it, it's just getting more complicated, right? With these new things. The, the whole thing about concurrent block producers. So basically for, for the listeners who are not aware, it's basically the idea. So, so this is something that has been uh, an idea in the Solana ecosystem for a long time, uh, Anatoly has been talking about this for years, but it's basically the idea of having uh, different block producers um, or different sort of validators produce blocks at the same time. Uh, so in the Solana world, it would be, you know, the validators kind of all, uh, let's say there's like five at the same time. They're all, you can send transactions to any of them. They all include them. And then somehow in the end, it gets kind of resolved about like, you know, the order. And uh, and I guess that's a similar, uh, that, that idea is being explored in Ethereum as well, to have like different people producing blocks at the same time. Uh, I'm not sure. Actually, I haven't really spent the time looking into this in terms of, you know, how it will work, what the implications are. I'm also not totally sure how uh, how far along that is and uh, how likely that is to happen anytime soon. Although it seems to be getting some traction and, and people seem to like, or some, some of the key people seem to like this direction. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's the, that's the reason. <laughs> the, the funny thing is, because um, cause the, the most popular, I, I guess, uh, at least so it seems, right, for looking from, from far away, the most popular solution, which is the Max Resnick's proposal of uh, uh, bra bra braids, I think, um, is incompatible with precons because you won't have you know a proposal that has the ability to to commit to uh, a future block because now you have like oh you have unionized uh, all these like number k of different like parallel chains that like unionize them or however it's is getting like uh, uh, agreed on in the end so like it just changes all the time you know and, and these are not small changes these are very fundamental changes i say all of a sudden okay we enter into a pre-conf uh market where uh all these pre-comforts pre-comforts right? it is it is actually worth it is a real, real world um um 
and the and, and just you know just bookmark that thought for a second. The the the, the thing with pre-confirmation is that you have a very complex market with a lot of like moving pieces, and you have so few players. Yeah, 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 yeah. It has so few players to 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 drive pricing. I mean, actually, it seems like whoever uh, it seems like the market for someone who would be interested in pre-confirmation is probably very similar to the market of someone who would be interested in some kind of you know uh, future of transaction fees right on ethereum or maybe even the same right maybe it's like i mean probably to a significant amount that there will be the same kind of players and maybe they're kind of like do you think these are substitutes like if you have free coughs and it's kind of like less important to like maybe hedge your future transaction fees yeah so i think physically uh, allocated block space are very very different kind of products from synthetic block space i guess uh blocks paper block space uh, with a lack of a better word um, and I think they're, they serve very different purpose and they serve very different uh, user base. Um, so with like these kind of, uh, I guess we can call pre confs or Pepsi as like physically allocated block space, right? I think these are more for, yeah, these are for block builders. It, it, it's, it's uh, you, the, the, the users who would use this are people who are very, very, uh, have very specific needs, have very high requirement for granularity of the ordering of the transactions and the timing of these transactions getting included in the block. Right? They, they want to pay for that guarantee. So I think that's the level of like precision that they're operating in order to for this kind of instruments. So the concern is less about like, hey, I want to uh, pay for uh, the, I want to pay for a future block because I want to lock in the, the base fee. I think it's, it's less, you know, less about that. Uh, and because, you know, frankly, the, the builders, they, they know exactly what the base fee is going to be <laughs> anyways. Um, whereas for paper block space, with you know, this kind of block space futures, uh, the kind of users it's servicing are businesses who are just trying to not think about like fees for a long period of time. Right? They are trying to have uh, this part of volatility removed or partially removed from their operating like day to day uh, operations. Uh, for OKX, for example, <laughs> they would, uh, if they're constantly hedged when they have this kind of like screw up, they would be able to at least like partially collect or fully collect their uh, loss, um, which is not something that you can really achieve with like physically allocated block space. And the kind of things that you can achieve with phys physically allocated block space of like, okay, I want to get my transaction into that specific block. That's not possible with paper block space because it's an entirely different thing. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Do you feel like any other chains are doing something interesting uh, related to block space besides uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum? Yeah, uh, I mean, Polkadot has been experimenting with this idea for a very long time, right? Like, I think um, they are the, this idea of like ephemeral uh, blockchain. Oh, sorry, ephemeral block. Yeah, ephemeral blockchain. Um, I, I think the the implementation, the design has evolved a lot for the past few years. Um, I always think that you know Polkadot people are the the the, the original crew. They're they're quite you know forward thinking in terms of um, how to manage like okay full node resources and that relations with with uh, with I guess uh, end users. The only problem is that I think they have gone to the rabbit hole a little bit too far. <laughs> you know, uh, so uh, so it's a little you know uh, what the, the kind of problem that they spent a lot of headspace on is. Uh, not something that end users, you know, particularly are interested in, right? So, um, I, I think that trade-off is, is 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 very hard to 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 balance. I mean, same can be said for Ethereum today. Um, to to be to be fair, maybe I mean you coming from the like uh, traditional finance space, right? So you have a lot of like finance knowledge as well. I'm curious, what are your thoughts on the current market, and where do you see things going? Oh, I mean, so I, I've spent far more time in crypto uh, than in traditional finance at this point. <laughs> uh, I think I've some seven years of full time in crypto, uh, three years in traditional finance after after graduating from college. Um, yeah, uh, I, I think I think it's hard, right? Like that, that I, I definitely I mean, have opinions, but I think uh, I definitely don't look at market as closely as uh, people who have more time, I guess. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's, 
I, I do think that, if, if anything, I do think ETH is probably a little oversold. <laughs> um, but at the same time, I think there are some bigger problems that, uh, more fundamental questions, I think ETH as uh, a community needs to, needs, to, needs to answer, right? Like, I think it's very clear that people are not happy about uh, how fragmented L2s are today. Um, and people are not necessarily happy with like the kind of questions that Ethereum foundations are choose to spend their time on, um, and how some of, you know, these newer proposals, they're further and further away from, uh, users. I actually think multi-concurrent proposal is, is pretty interesting. Um, cause the, the trade-off is very, very clear, right? Like, uh, okay. Censorship resistance, um, and, and, and the but of, of course it breaks a few things including pre-confirmations um and, and there are a lot of like ux trade-offs like okay more transactions are going to get reverted uh, and of course the, the the all of the proposals are still very much in early stage um i yeah i, I just, i'm just curious like how validators um adjust to these kind of like big drastic changes um because they do affect like how how you collect revenue and I guess a lot of these things uh, they have been such that validators can kind of you know just run the software and it works and you know even like proposal builder separation I mean that that I guess was the big or the big uh, thing that Flashbots like achieved right they said like hey just uh, just run this other client and uh, and they basically it takes care of everything. So the validator doesn't actually have to know that much, right? And uh, and you can make more money, right? So I think in the end, they got so much adoption at the time, right? So this was still proof of work days, right? But I think they got something like 80, 90% of the hashing power uh, to use that. And I think they did it because like, it, you know, it really abstracted away and like validators don't really have to worry about it. And, uh, and I think that's still the case today, right? Like most validators, they don't really have to worry about like, how does all of this work? Some of them go much deeper. Like, so we have gone very deep there at course one, right? Where we basically, you know, modified the Ethereum client and then would, would measure, you know, different parameters in the network, different things we can control to try to build more valuable blocks. And then, you know, we, we have been, you know, we are able to do that. And then, you know, we're able to like, uh, generate maybe something like a little bit less than 10% in additional MEV revenues. So there's, there's a bit, a bit that, you know, there are some things you can do there, but then that sort of requires a lot of sophistication and, uh, and it's probably not something that's like worth it for most validators, they, but they just sort of like run it. And then I think fine. So I think most validators, honestly, I don't think they really worry too much about you know, concurrent proposers or things like that. I guess they will have to worry about it once, uh, once it comes, and then you know, I guess we will see what the implications will be. It was certainly will, possible it will break a bunch of stuff, right? Maybe it breaks pre-confirmations. Maybe I don't know what it means for block builders, but I think that I I would say on on a high level, right? A lot of the move hassles of of proposal builder separation has been that a lot of the complexity and sophistication has been uh, moved to the builder and and the validators have, you know, less, uh, less sort of degrees of freedom of, which is maybe, for example, what's somewhat interesting there is like, I think Solana is maybe a bit different, right? Where Solana, there's also a lot of things happening, a lot of transactions. There's a lot of MEV on Solana uh, and there is a lot of de degrees of freedom now how you can run things, right? So you have a client called GTOR, right? That does like some MEV. Then there's another thing, um, I think it's called stake weighted quality of service, where basically um, someone will pay validators for including transactions. Um, and then you can make additional revenues from that. So. And then some of these things can work with other things or not work with other things. So we have also gone, you know, gone to some lengths there to like, you know, try out different things, test what works better, what generates higher revenues. So I think Solana is probably the other ecosystem where there's actually a lot of, 
I mean, it's, uh, Bitcoin, I guess, there's not that much happening, right? In this, maybe some things on that, but but I think it's really like Ethereum first, and then Solana probably second, where you know you really have enough activity happening, enough MEV, enough of this kind of value that's there that you know people can really try out a lot of things, and it's worth it. Um, so I think it would be very interesting to see both these places evolve, and and of course they have like very different philosophies as well. I feel like in Ethereum, it's much more something where the Ethereum Foundation and core development is sort of trying to steer things in a certain direction and control things. Whereas I feel like with Solana, a lot of the stuff is like different teams and protocols just building on top. And I think Solana, the Solana core development is a bit less involved there. Although I guess this, I mean, I'm not actually sure how far they are with the whole, you know, concurrent proposer thing on the Solana side. Uh, I know it's been an idea for many years, but I, I, I'm not sure if this is actually something that's being uh, uh, being built. I haven't heard at least of, of this being uh, far along. Um, but yeah, in general, I think it's mostly other teams like, you know, G2 blocks are out and a bunch of others that are building some of these things on top of Solana. Yeah. Yeah. It, it definitely feels like, um, with Solana, the, 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 the building blocks are, I guess, slightly more decentralized in some sense. Right. The, the, I guess people who are building like the critical toolings and critical infrastructures sure. in that sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the trade-offs are, are also very, uh, clear. Um, but, yeah, it, it's definitely, it, it's definitely very, very different type of experience. Transactions you know, barely land, but but that's a slightly different thing. Um, but it's one thing that's pretty interesting is, you know, I, I guess most people don't have like a lot of visibility on staking business because it's just you know so far away from uh, uh, everyday life. Um, it's, it's it's pretty interesting. Like like some validators, right? Like like yourself would. Um, invest so heavily into R and D and look at okay additional ways to capture uh, MEVs and try to like capture these I guess additional alpha uh, and it comes with cost right? it comes with time energy like manpower uncertainty and I guess some like most staking businesses they just uh, spend money on BD and just try to like get as many whales as possible uh, and, and and don't really care about like oh what's going on with uh, with the uh, like what's cha- like what's changing underneath? Yeah, certainly. Cool. Well, thanks so much for coming on, Leo. It was great to talk to you, and I'm excited to see sort of how this whole thing is gonna evolve. I think it's gonna be interesting, especially uh, you know with some blockchains becoming more mature, right? And with uh, I think some of these markets will really start to emerge, and I'm excited to see how Alchemia is going to uh, go and play out there. Yeah, I'm pretty excited myself. Cool. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you.